Hello again. As you know, I am Eli, the computer guy, and today we're going to be doing an interview with the CEO and founder of Cujo. So Cujo is this IoT security device. Basically, what you do is you plug this onto your your home or your small business network, and it tries to protect uh, your devices and your network from attacks that try to go after IoT devices. So they sent me this nice little unit. We're going to be uh, we're actually going to be doing a little uh, video on this unit probably next week, but I want to talk to him since he's a startup founder of a hardware startup company. Again, this is something that you have to be thinking about. You know, whenever we talk about startup companies, everybody always thinks about like the next Facebook, right? The next Facebook, the next dog dating app, you know, mobile apps, web apps, so on and so forth. But the cool new sexy thing, what their cool kids are doing now are hardware startups. So he founded uh, this company, this Cujo, uh, to create these IoT security devices. So we will talk to him about why he created the company down in LA, how he got this device manufactured, and uh, some of the other interesting stuff that goes into uh, IoT security, hardware startups, so on and so forth. So that is going to be our nice little interview for today. Now, before we get to the interview, though, again, we've always got to talk about our sponsors, because as I say, sponsors are what pays the bills. You may not like to hear the sponsors, but, well, (laughs) you like to hear the rest of the content, so... So just sit there for a second and listen to the sponsors, boys and girls. Uh, So we've got Veeam, V-E-E-A-M, free backup for PCs, VMs, and Linux, all at veeam.com. Dev Mountain. Dev Mountain is a 12-week web development iOS and UX design boot camp intended to get you a full-time job in the industry. Learn to code at devmountain.com. INE. INE specializes in network training with hands-on labs, on-site boot camps, and a focus on delivering the best in online networking courses. INE.com. Schooly Mitchell. Schooly Mitchell's purpose is to increase clients' profit by reducing telecom costs using software and processes at no risk. We only share savings. SchoolyMitchell.com. Plixer. With scrutinizer and flow data, users can determine what traffic is on the network, who is originating the traffic, and who is receiving it. Plixer.com. And finally, Gilware Data Recovery. Uh, Gilware's partner programs help computer repair and IT professionals make money by offering data recovery services to their customers. Gilware.com. And as I say, I do not care if you thumb up, thumb down, leave a comment, or even subscribe. But if you could click on those uh, those sponsor links below that would be highly appreciated so with that let's jump over into this this interview i did over skype uh, and we can learn about iot security again like i say uh, hardware startups and the whole nine yards so I'm here with Einris von Gravlock, uh, CEO and founder of cujo and we're going to be talking about his little cujo IoT security device here. I'm not even sure what one of these things is actually called, but basically he's the CEO and founder of the company that created this little device. And so we're going to talk to him about how he how he came up with this idea, basically how he created the company, and also how he how he got to be where he is now. Because I know I was looking through Crunchbase, and there was some random comment talking about how. You took a back of the napkin idea and turned it into a $50 million company in like three years. Yeah. So that happened. Uh, Thank thank you for having us. Of course. Thank you for having me. So, uh, you know, we, we, we have some background, me and my co-founders in the enterprise security space. Oh, okay. And if you follow the news last couple of days, Friday specifically, smart devices broke the internet, right? Yep. And that was mainstream news because of the scale of the attack. But we've been seeing those type of attacks for a number of years now. So at first, we were protecting enterprises you know, in a, in a different setting at other companies against these attacks. Yep. But then we tried to look for solutions that would sort of uh, eliminate any attacks, uh, eliminate the attacks themselves. Uh, and we, that, that was one sort of vantage point at uh, IoT security. Uh, and the other is, you know, I, I, I live in a home, I have kids, I have a bunch of devices, cameras, IP cameras, webcams, tablets, iPads, et cetera, et cetera. And just kind of dawned on me, you know, those two ideas, ideas merged and I realized that there was nothing really that was being done to protect networks, home networks. Okay. Um, if you think about your home, uh, you know, all these cool devices that you started adding, um, they're not, they don't have any security, and these companies are not security companies. Yeah. I mean, we know from the PC world that those PC makers never figured out the security. They they had companies such as Norton and Symantec and McAfee and all these other great companies handle that for them, right? Yeah. 
So now you're home and you've got the camera, you've got the TV, you've got uh, this, you know, Alexa or whatnot device that's always listening to you. And you're thinking you're fine until uh, until you're not, until there's a hack and until they start to listening to you, extracting financials, valuable information, or most private sensitive information. Uh, and as a consumer up until now, there's really nothing you could do. You can't install antivirus into a TV, right? Yeah. Yep. And some of our consumers are thinking, all right, so no, not our consumers, but some people in general would argue that, so who cares? They hacked my light bulb. They're going to turn <laughs> off the lights, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not about that. It's about what happens next. Mm -hmm. Because if uh, someone wants to take over your network, uh, the next step they'll do is they will, uh, you know, they'll use that light bulb to get into your PC or your laptop. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then what does, so what does this device then do? Like what, cause that, that was, that's what's kind of interesting with it. It's not actually a router. It's not a wireless access point. Um, yeah. you set it up and I, I was got, I was going to test this out, um, before we talked, but actually it's a little bit more complicated than your marketing material gives it credit for. Cause it says it's plug and play. And I didn't realize I was going to have to tweak my DHCP settings and all the server settings and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so so what this is, is Kujo is a smart firewall. So it's complementary to a router. We, we didn't want to replace a router. There's a ton of outstanding routers out there. Yeah. And they're great for doing Wi-Fi. They're great for forwarding packets, etc. Yeah. Um, but routers are not built with security in mind. And there's very little you can do in a router from a security perspective just because the device itself is they're, they're rarely built strong enough to do any form of security. So Kujo is a firewall. It attaches to uh, a network. Uh, that router, yeah. um, and then it basically starts inspecting traffic on your network. So it looks for anomalies, it looks for behavioral um, uh, anomalies. So if suddenly your camera is being accessed from a country 5,000 miles away, is that normal? Hmm. Or if suddenly one of the, your devices attempts to spoof the router and pretend to be the router itself in order to get access to your information, is that normal? If your phone, which has no form of, you know, antivirus on it, suddenly you're using it to go to um, malicious sites, you're tricked into malvertisement sites or ransomware mal malware sites, really. Yeah. Uh, we look for those things on the whole network level, okay. and we stop them. So simply put, think of Kujo as an immunity system that you add to your network okay. to keep you safer from these hacks or cyber threats. Whereas antivirus is something you have on your laptop, on your PC, yeah. to extract the threat uh, once AV can find it, once antivirus can find it, if it can find it. Yeah. So, uh, so then how does this so, protect the, the, the you know, network? Kujo is cool in that you get an app, so you yeah. get to control the entire Kujo experience over the app. Yeah. Uh, you see every single device on your network. And if you're away, if you're you know, on, on a trip or whatever at work, You'll get a notification if something happens to your to your home, if uh, there's some sort of a threat that's happening, and uh, we block it automatically. Now we're not going to stop your devices from working, yeah. uh, but we will block that particular threat, um, you know, the source and destination of that threat, so you can you know continue enjoying your devices without having to disconnect them. So is this basically is this just blocking ports to the to the internet access? Or how, well, how is it doing the blocking? That's part of it. Because we act as the DHCP server, we issue IP addresses, so we do get to control uh, what you, your devices, what uh, destinations and sources they ultimately communicate to. Yeah. But like, so, so, so how, how is it controlling that? Well, as a DHCP server, you get, you, we take over the full functionality of the router. So effectively, what the router continues to do is uh, the, the router remains a Wi-Fi antenna. Yeah. Um, and we do the rest of the functionality. So it's pretty close to a router, but nonetheless, it's a complementary device. Okay. But how, how do you secure it, though? I mean, are you blocking, like I say, is, are you blocking ports? Are you giving the, uh, oh, the devices bad default gateways? I mean, how, how are you actually doing that prevention? 
we're definitely blocking ports absolutely okay so it's just through the blocking ports okay that's interesting so then you put this on this gives the dhcp address uh, to all the the different clients but then this also then communicates up to the cloud this communicates to your servers right so uh, that's a cool thing about it is uh, we get to do much of the heavy lifting in the cloud so on any given network we take metadata basically packet header information yeah uh, I'll, i'm trying for this not to be overly technical but uh we take packet header information as snippets of the beginnings of a packet mm -hmm. and we send it for analysis to the cloud so some of the security features that we have are asynchronous mm -hmm. uh, meaning you continue uh, browsing experiencing you know your devices keep talking to the internet while we are uh, building statistical profiles and looking for anomalies yep. Uh, other, uh, other forms of security, such as, for example, safe browsing are synchronous, meaning, uh, before we let it out, before we let, uh, you access a particular website, we will check whether it's legit. Okay. Now, some of it we will do locally and uh, we're caching quite a bit on the machine. Yeah. Uh, other things we do in the cloud, uh, latency is super minimal. I mean, we're talking about a fraction of a blink of a second. Yeah. Because we're taking so little data, we don't have to send your entire information to the cloud. Okay. Um, and it, why why this is important is because we get to give you we, we give you security features that you otherwise wouldn't be able to fit into a small machine like this. Okay. Um, secondly, you know we like to think of it as building a cyber neighborhood watch because uh, when you're attacked, when your Kujo spots a, a threat and blocks it. Obviously, the cloud knows about it, and my Kujo learns about it immediately. Hmm. So the more Kujos out there, the safer all of us become, um, you know, literally. Um, so let's see, what else? Um, well, that's in a nutshell, you know, how, how it's designed to work. Okay. So then, especially with all the concerns with NSA and all that kind of stuff nowadays, does does that mean the Cujo is telling your servers literally where all of my packets are going? Well, so let's say you go to ESPN. Yeah. So we will, our algorithms, not me, but our algorithms, we will see the traffic and they will understand that you went to this particular destination. Yeah. We have no idea whether you're reading uh, about the Warriors or about, or about the Spurs. Okay. So we do not know the content of, of, of the page. Um, we don't need to. That's why we're not taking the full packet. We're only taking packet headers. Okay, but you are taking all the packet headers. Absolutely. And we're yeah. encrypting them. We're sending them to our cloud. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, just as uh, we're, we're taking quite a bit less than your average telecom would take. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Um, have you thought about the like the national security implications of that? I mean, like what happens if NSA kind of knocks on your door asking for all that information? Because isn't well, that basically the whole metadata thing that everybody lost their mind about a couple of years ago? Well, you know, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> it's a slippery question, right? Yeah. Uh, let me put it this way um, without trying to offend anyone. <laughs> yeah. We are probably the wrong, the wrong door to knock at. Okay. I mean, um, we collect. We have a. I mean, we collect so little data about an average user. Yeah. Uh, data that any internet provider already has. Okay. Yeah. So I think there's easier avenues <laughs> to get that. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, okay. it hasn't happened so far. So then with this, I mean, it seems like a good idea. Um, I guess one of the questions is, I know you said, and I watched your TechCrunch Disrupt video, where you're, you're saying one of the reasons you made this as not a router is because there are so many old routers out there. But, yeah. I mean, if you're creating, because that's what I kind of looked at as, as a product. If you've, already gone, if you've already gone to this much trouble, I mean, this takes a lot of work. This takes a lot of work, a lot of engineering. I'm kind of surprised you just didn't suction cup a router and access point onto this thing and just call it a full-fledged unit. Like, what what was the decision, like, really not to go that extra 20 bucks? Sure. Well, it, it's, it's twofold. Yeah. Um, so from a strategy perspective, router companies are going to ultimately deliver our service to their consumers. Okay. So I, I don't want to compete with them because they're our partners and we're working with a bunch to ultimately make it happen. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
It's not going to happen over the next couple of months. Uh, simply put, because most routers made out there, which is not capable to do security. Yeah. Too, the hardware is too minimal. I mean, we're talking about Raspberry Pi level of hardware, if that. Yeah. yeah. Um, some next-gen routers coming out there are definitely capable, and and you will see Kujo as part of those routers. Ah, okay. Because uh, we we really are a security company. I mean, we're a security and a software company, so that's the ultimate play. Yeah. Uh, that being said, the cool thing about the Kujo device itself is is the hardware in it is is, is super powerful. It's a it's a very very powerful chipset. Uh, it won't add latency. Uh, it it uh, we do packet inspection and we do some of the security features as really at the metal level. Uh, so the, the chipset we're using, you know, traditionally is, was used for servers and uh, IDS, IPS systems for businesses. Hmm. So we're, we're quite proud of what, what, what we've uh, done with the hardware. Yeah. Okay. And then with that, though, like with this device, looking at it, having been a consultant, like it seems more like you would go after the small business or the business clients, like, you know, yeah, multiply it, you know charge five or ten times as much and go after the business clients like what was the decision to go after consumers because do, do the consumers really know that they need this i mean do they really care that much oh, absolutely yeah. so uh i mean there's increasing awareness and especially after last week this became a mainstream topic i mean we're flooded with emails with orders etc last couple of days yeah, okay. uh, so i mean if you think about the consumers and if you think about yourself or, or me really I'm not buying a Kujo to protect my light bulbs or to protect IOTs. I'm buying it to protect my entire network just because I know now when I go online, yeah. it's no longer that private place where I used to go 20 years ago. Now it's a place where I'm always mindful of someone's looking at my camera, is someone snooping on my credit cards and all of that information. So uh, we're, at, we're adding a layer, a security layer, a layer that uh, you know no one else has been providing so far to home consumers. Yeah. Now, businesses and enter enterprises, of course, there's the Palo Alto networks, there's the Junipers of the world, yeah. oh, outstanding appliances and companies that have been securing them in similar ways, you know, for a number of years now. Yeah. Uh, but not homes, not consumers, and so it's a big market. You know, yeah. we're talking about 140 million homes in the U.S. Hmm. Uh, okay. And yeah, some won't need it. You know, some people, some people will not rent their bed on Airbnb either. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> But there's quite a few that are definitely, you know, definitely needed, are interested in. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we're off to a fairly good start so far. Since you're working with partners, um, have you ever thought about just providing the operating system and then charging for the service? Like, you know, was it DDWRT, like the open source router operating system, so that people can build their own gadgets and then just pay you for the, the cloud services? No, not not necessarily open source. I mean, it's an option, but we haven't explored it okay. you know, thoroughly. I mean, our guys come and some of them, you know, contributed to to writing that that open source software, so we're very familiar with it. Yeah. Uh, but but from a business standpoint, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. So not then, that what's that? Not a bad idea. <laughs> so then, so with Cujo, so so how long has your company been around for? Uh, about two years now. About two years, and then what? What gave you the initial idea to do this? Like, what? We're sitting there getting drunk one night and went, "I want a, I want a thing on my network." Like, what? What was the what impetus for this? Well, I mean, we knew of a problem. So, like I said, with uh, with entry, within enterprise security firms that yeah. we came from, I mean, we were aware of a problem. Period. Okay. And um, like it just dawned on us. I mean, look, just looking out on the house, we started buying devices. I started buying devices. My co-founder. Yeah. And uh, mindful of security, we, we start getting alarmed. Like, mm -hmm. all right, so how do we do this? Mm -hmm. I've got two kids as well, little kids, and they that are on iPads all the time now. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, that was that was a little concerning. I was thinking about parental controls. Should we start there? Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, security seemed like an area that's uh, just no one else was doing it, so it made sense. Okay. I mean, we've all set up machine like uh, junipers uh, etc and uh, just why why wasn't there one for the home or small businesses yeah okay. and also to your previous point yeah small businesses definitely buy kuja as is because if you're a doctor a lawyer if you got 
10, 15, 20 employees, he probably can't afford a service or a, a, a an employee that will take care of your Juniper and maintain it and change the access rules and firewall rules and all of that. So there's a gap. There's a gap between you know us regular people and then uh, serious businesses. So then, I guess with that, then if small businesses are buying this, then I mean, uh, approximately, how how many devices can this thing theoretically secure? Like the largest one we've been at uh, is a hundred employees, so a hundred workstation type of a environment, okay. uh, a full office, and we're talking about one hundred employees working simultaneously. Really? Wow. Uh, okay. So it, that did its job. Uh, now. We've got individual users with 120 plus uh, devices in a home. Uh, <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. Oh, so okay. we're talking about connected bathtubs, etc. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, so you can see the thing is, it it, it then becomes really a function of a router. Yeah. Uh, it's unlikely that there are routers out there, uh, you know, home and small business routers that are much more powerful than Kujo is um, yeah. because the chipset is, is truly powerful. It's a gigabit uh, Ethernet. It's a dual-core cavium chipset. It's it's a very powerful computer. Interesting. So then when you got this idea, did you did you just quit your job immediately and jump onto this? Or how long did it take from that, that napkin sketch to actually doing something? Well, I didn't have a job that particular yeah. time. Right. So <laughs> okay. it... it uh, Everything came together very quickly. I think within the first month we were coding. Really? Wow. wow, wow. Yeah. And then how, where did you, how did you figure out, because that's one thing, like like hardware startups are supposed to be the new sexy thing now. Like mo- mobile startups is 2010 and hardware startups is like now. Like how did you, how did you figure out how to actually get a product manufactured? Like did you get any help or support with that? Mostly for mistakes, trial and error. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> Well, you know, obviously we came in, we, we were coming from software. Yeah. So going into hardware, we made a lot of assumptions that hardware was very simpler, similar to software. Mm, okay. Very different. Yeah. It's uh, it's a lot slower. It's, uh, you know, the ecosystem, the, the, the industry, It uh, you cannot iterate on a daily basis. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we learned a lot. And then ultimately, uh, we, we brought in a co-founder, someone from Apple. Somebody who uh, you know brought ten years of Apple experience building hardware, okay. and then you know things became a lot easier after that. Oh, interesting. So then, how did you find who you were going to outsource the manufacturing to? Did you just go oh. on the web and uh, that one? Or... Well, uh, no. So so we 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 interviewed and we basically spoke our feed. We did the entire process. We spoke with uh, some of the largest manufacturers in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know. We're under NDA with them, but companies that would produce, you know, appliances that you use on a daily basis. Okay. But ultimately, we found a factory over in Illinois, uh, a smaller company, smaller outfit. Really? That did the end-to-end uh, job here in the U.S., yeah. manufactured in the U.S., engineered it in the U.S., and uh, you know, were nimble and flexible to work with us in the states. Huh. So, I mean, is that a uh... That's actually interesting. I mean, is that is that a red, red, white, and white and blue? Let's all be patriotic, or was it actually a business's decision to do it in the U.S.? I mean, it's a lot easier to do it in the states. Uh, this stage as, as a startup, if you if you want to do it in China, you've got to be there, live there. Huh, okay. uh, you know, uh, as a hardware startup, it's. A, I mean, I would I would find it. I don't know. I, I don't know how someone would do it remotely. Hmm. China is different. Yeah. Hardware is complicated. And we lived there at the factory here in Illinois. I mean, we, we had to touch and feel it for months. Okay. Um, so it's a it's it's quite an intensive process. But if anyone's you know whoever is watching and if they are interested in building hardware, I would highly recommend to do it in the states at least in the beginning. So like, how many? I mean, can you say somewhere like vaguely like what what the initial purchase is? Like how much do you have to be willing to spend to get a product? Somewhere vague. <laughs> well, which part? The, the engineering part of it, or let's order units? Let's let the let's order units. Well, it depends. I mean, there are many companies, especially in the Bay Area, that, that specialize in very short runs, small runs, such as 100, 500 units. Hmm, okay. So you can do that. It'll yeah. cost you an arm and a leg. 
<laughs> but maybe you want prototype software. Maybe you want 100 units floating out there, you know, as a proof of concept. Hmm. Okay. Um, it really, really depends on the type of hardware you're using because the, the, the word you've got there in Kujo is yeah. custom. I mean, we engineered it from scratch. Really? Okay. Uh, and I think many people listening, whoever wants to build theirs, they'll probably be using something like Raspberry or other computers that you can, you know, quickly put together to do a, a, a then it becomes a matter of assembly. Um, and assembly is easy. Oh, okay. So then why did you decide, I mean, in this modern world with a thousand different IoT boards out there, why would you decide to design your own board? Because all of, most of the others, probably all of the others, are not secure. They're hackable. Right. I mean, almost by definition, they're built to hack, right? To put together things. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So we spent, uh, you know, a lot of resources, both financial and, and human resources, on securing this little device. Yeah, okay, huh, that's cool. And then, so you're you're out of LA, right? Yeah. Is is the company out of LA? Uh, well, we have three offices: one in LA, one in Brazil, and one in Europe. Oh, okay. So then, why why LA? I mean. This is... Especially if you're already in California, why why are you not in Silicon Valley or San Francisco or whatever? We're in Silicon Beach. <laughs> Silicon Beach, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a bunch of uh, startups obviously in LA area that do hardware. Yeah, uh, I mean hardware hardware makes sense in LA uh, also because you know we've been making things such as airplanes here in LA for a few decades. Okay, so there's a lot of talent, a lot of people who know how to do this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do you find, is there is the tech community very useful there for you? Like a lot of people talk about the startup community. You need a good startup community. Has that actually mattered that much for you there? I mean, the world is just so small. Yeah, we, yeah. You know, I, I, t I go to San Francisco almost every week and it's like, you know, it's like taking a bus right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, after this call, I'll probably call Brazil and it'll be like calling Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, it, it helps, you know, the, the, it helps to stumble into people on the street. And obviously, the Valley, San Francisco is the place for that. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot easier now than it was 10 years ago. So then with Bra Brazil, you say, so what's, why did you open office an office in Brazil? Uh, we found a, a, a couple of people to start and then built a whole team about around um, appliance engineering so coding linux c etc really uh, yeah and uh, like lua is one of the languages we're using and it started in brazil and we basically found people who were coding in lua from early days of lua oh okay that's interesting yeah. was that people that that you knew was why you went there or is brazil just like you were saying with lua is that just the place to go a good good place for iot stuff now we we knew someone there and we we built around that person. Okay, yeah. that's cool. Um, let's see here. Da -da. Let's see here. So then, so you're you're still a startup company though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I'm not sure when you stop being a startup company. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably leave at that point, but, yeah. but we are. So you've got you're getting funding and all that. Have you got it? Because I looked at Crunchbase, and you're like one of the only people that basically uh, whatever your funding is, you wouldn't talk about it on there. Uh, I mean, I think we announced something back when we launched. Yeah. But we've been, we've been self-funded, so it's a it's a private group of people, basically mostly friends and family. Really. Uh, yeah. So not 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 much to announce about that. Yeah. So why? I mean, like with something like this, I mean, it sounds seems like, I mean, isn't this the perfect startup of just crap ton of money and scale and sell to Google? Like, why, why haven't you got an investment then? Well, we haven't looked for it or sought those investments. I mean, we've we've made it this far, and um, this isn't the first time we're doing it. Um, so uh, we sort of, you know. We think this is an amazing thing, an amazing idea, and especially when you see the internet being brought down on on on, on a <laughs> average Friday, yeah. it just shows you how how big of a problem this is. So, you know, we we built a kick-ass platform that yeah. that will power all these devices, secure all these devices, and I don't know, we we've been trying to make it uh, as far as we can with our own money. 
Oh, okay. Do you plan? I mean, do you plan to exit this? Do you plan to just try to sell this thing to Netgear and go off to the beach for a while? Huh. Well, uh, you know, as a CEO with shareholders, I mean, these are still shareholders. I guess my job is to make sure that there's always options. You know, at whatever time of a company cycle we are. Yeah. And these investors clearly they they didn't invest just uh, just for the idea of it. They wanted a turn at some point. And then, so with the pricing of this thing, so it's ninety nine dollars plus like eight ninety nine per month. Yeah, yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, like, how did you figure out like that price? Like, why why not nine ninety nine a month or five ninety nine a month or whatever? You know. I think the connection. Can you still hear me, Eli? I think the connection is. Yeah, I can hear you iffy. fine. Are you there? Yeah, I'm back. Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> <laughs> Must be our file. <laughs> yeah. um, so, so with the with the pricing of this, um, you know, it's it's ninety nine dollars for the device plus eight ninety nine per month. Um, yeah. Where, how did you figure out that pricing? Like, why not eighty nine dollars or why not nine ninety nine a month? Well, the, the device fee is a function of how much uh, the hardware costs us. Uh, we're basically, we're not making money on the hardware. Hmm. Um, as really? Far... So this thing costs you ninety nine dollars to make? Oh yeah. Uh, it's a... <laughs> wow. It's a very powerful computer. Really? Wow. Okay. Uh, and uh, and and the monthly, we obviously give six months uh, trial to try it out. Yeah. Uh, to experience it before you have to pay it. Yeah. But the monthly, the way I see it, I mean, uh, you can look at it as two cups of coffee a month, or as you know, a buck less than you would be paying LifeLock. For life of value that you've been hacked. Yeah, yeah. We're trying to prevent it from happening. All right. But I mean, did you, was there some math or method to coming up with that price? Or were you all just sitting around with a couple of beers going, eight ninety nine? Yeah, I, I like eight ninety nine. I don't you know. It was somewhere in between. <laughs> so, there were no beers, but, uh, <laughs> you know, as a startup, you make quick decisions. Uh, we, we, we did survey people. We used Google, cons- uh, Google consumer surveys. Okay. To find out, uh, okay. we looked at comparables. We looked at credit reports. We looked at LifeLock. We looked at Netflix. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, and then you you have a Cujo Forever price, which is eight ninety nine. Yeah, it's a nine hundred dollar price point. Yeah. But then it says, what I was curious about, it says five device upgrades. Does that actually mean you send out a new widget every year or something? Yeah. Once if. If and when we have new devices, physical hardware, yeah, we will definitely. Okay. And and part part of that is the eight ninety nine price point, and we sold a ton of these at eight ninety nine. Yeah. Uh, it was it was it's there. It was there, just <laughs> yeah. to help us with cash flow. Uh, yeah. Fronted for us, you know, that's one ways uh, one of the ways we were able to do it without getting institutional money. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a cool offer. For I me, mean, for a lot of people, they, they buy it and we'll set them up, you know, in perpetuity now with Kujo devices. Yeah. Um, the other cool thing is we talk to those people, not just them. I mean, in general, we started with a community of uh, folks when we started building Kujo. Yeah. So we get to, I personally get to interact with all the 899 buyers as well as as well as many of the regular consumers. Right. So when when they bought that 899 price point, was that were they buying that because they thought it was a good price, or were they buying that because they support you and they know you need more money? Uh, probably because it's a good product. Yeah. Because these are these are people who you know. However, they found our website. Yeah. We, we obviously they're strangers to us up until yeah. they started buying. Okay. So yeah. All right. So is there when you do something like this, um, are there any legal requirements for how long you're supposed to stay alive? Because isn't that there was some IoT company that lots of people bought all their devices and then they went, eh, fuck it, we're done. And like yeah, the, oh. the one that Google acquired, right? Yeah. Um, so is, is there any legal or is it all just, you know? Well, absolutely. I mean, it's regulated. States regulated. California is especially uh, consumer favorable. So we are in California. Um, I I would say that when we started the business, we weren't planning the doomsday. But uh, so uh, I can't say what exactly the requirements are because it doesn't really matter to us. We're we're here for good. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's definitely regulations. 
Okay. And then, so I was noticing, I think, I think where I found you originally was on Indiegogo. I think I actually yeah. got a press release. So then just out of curiosity, why did you choose Indiegogo versus Kickstarter? Uh, I called both in the, in the gave us a better deal. I mean, huh. they basically, and many people do not know that, but if you, if you run something like, like an indie campaign, an Indiegogo campaign, yep. there are people on the other side that you, they can help you and work with you. Huh. Okay. So you don't just launch on day one and see what happens. There's a lot of prep work. Yeah. And Indiegogo especially helps you through the process. Oh, okay. That's so they vet you, they help you, they tell you how to set up your campaign, they tell you how to do press, they tell you how to what to expect when you launch. Oh. Uh, it's a very interesting and uh, process. And I have to say, I mean, since then we've we've worked with retailers, but no one has been as hands on as Indiegogo it was. So if you were coming out with a new product in the future, would you would you launch it on Indiegogo again? Well, if there was a choice between Indie and Kickstarter, I mean, I always negotiate, so I'd go <laughs> back to both. Okay. Yeah. But you know, my my experience with Indie has only been positive. Okay. And then, so off the Indiegogo, you got somewhere like three hundred and twenty some odd thousand dollars in sales, right? Yeah. So is there something? other than having an awesome product. Is there something that you did in order to get that kind of number? Did you hire any kind of PR company or, I don't know, do something special? We did hire a PR company, but I would never do that again. So it's like one of my sins of the past. I would never, ever hire PR. Why? Why is that? Never, never say never, but <laughs> I'm saying never. Yep. It's, you, have to, you have to hustle. I mean, People such as yourself that are out there, they're willing to talk, uh, they're willing to give you, you know, uh, the audience. Yeah. Uh, but the, you've you've got to come out, come out with a good product, come out with a great message, be genuine, and and just hustle. Talk to people, follow them, read what they what they air and what they they write, and and um, that's how you get press, not not by hiring a PR company. <laughs> really? Okay. So then who did you, who do you go after then to try to talk to for press and all that kind of stuff? Do you have contacts at TechCrunch or like do you just randomly email people or what do you do? Well, so it was a probably like a six month project mm -hmm. that, you know, me and another person, we, we focused on that sort of morning to evening. Yeah. And uh, it started with we built a, a community. So we, we, we opened up a Facebook group, uh, you know, it's like a closed secret Facebook group where we would invite people, yeah. uh, just people who are passionate about IoT, about gadgets, about security. Hmm. And we built a community, people who, first of all, they helped us shape a product and, and, and make it what it is you know, with ideas and feedback. And secondly, when the time came, they were this amplifier. People, when we launched on, on, on Indie, they were there to talk and spread the word about, about us, about Kujo. Um, and simultaneously, we, we had someone scrape the internet, collect all the contacts, all the media, you know, start connecting with them long before the campaign started okay. yep. and then start reaching out. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I mean, uh, press, press is great, but mm -hmm. like TechCrunch is almost never going to cover an indie or a Kickstarter campaign. Not anymore. Really? They'll do it occasionally now and then. Um, so if someone's planning this, you know, planning a, a, some sort of a product launch, yeah. don't bank on press giving you a lift. Um, just don't just focus on, focus really on building communities and people who need your product. Interesting. But then I noticed though, like I said, I was watching your TechCrunch disrupt video, which I guess was from not that long ago. Then how did you get onto TechCrunch disrupt and get into that, the whole competition there? So we, I mean, uh, being a startup, we follow all of these competitions and, and, yeah. and TechCrunch is like, you know, maybe the holy grail or at least <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it gives you quite a bit of visibility. So it's always been that dream to be, to be able to get there. Yeah. Um, no secret sauce. I mean, we just, we looked, we went to the application page and we just applied. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, now... You know, as an alumni, I'm able to now recommend other companies into the competition. So there's that factor. You know, they they seek out and they work with the alumni. Yeah. Um. But but yeah, I mean, 
it always helps to know someone, but in our case, we didn't. And uh, we've, we've, we've done a bunch of competitions. I just came back from France last week yeah. or this week. Last week, we did a Nokia challenge. And yeah. We won the Nokia Innovation Challenge. Um, so we're doing this, these regularly. Uh, part of it is validation. Part of it is business development. Part of it is just uh, you know, marketing. So are competitions good? Because I know, I know I've heard in the startup world, a lot of people have started arguing against competitions, that it's, it's the, like the wrong, fo- you know, instead of, instead of focusing on the customer that's going to give you money, you start focusing on, you know, I don't know, winning stars. Yeah, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, that, you know, to prepare for Nokia, it took me a grand total of a couple of hours. So it's, no. not, like, it's not like I had to spend a month strategizing around it. Do you do you get much money out of it? Like I know, like at least a few years ago, a lot of these competitions would give a chunk of money, twenty five thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars. Do the competitions now generally give money? Yeah, I mean, if you win it, absolutely. And I think yeah. the, I think the TechCrunch prize is something like fifty thousand. Obviously, we didn't win it. Oh wow! Uh, so so that helps. I mean, if you win it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So with this also, we're talking about TechCrunch and all of that, have you dealt with any accelerators or incubators or any of that kind of thing for this? No, no, no. Okay. Um, we, um, there's a, I think there's a lot of benefits, especially in the hardware. There's a bunch of incubators like in the Valley yeah. that help hardware companies start uh, you know, the product, really prototype it. Okay. So I think there's a, quite a bit of benefit. There's retail incubators as well. Yeah. for companies that want to enter retail. Um, so if I were to do an incubator in any endeavor, I would like to, I would try to do it with a strategic partner, such as say, you know, Cedar Sinai has a, an incubator for medical companies. Hmm. Okay. Which is a no brainer because you, you get the partner and a shareholder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you would otherwise come back and try to sell into, you know. Um, but we didn't. In our case we, we didn't do that. That's interesting. So it's really interesting because, like I say, I talked with a lot of startup companies, and the whole thing is, again, getting investors, getting accelerators, or getting this. But you guys, you've just you've been doing it on your own, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we, we we had we had the means to do it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then, what what is your background then? I mean, to be able to to do something like this, get this off the ground in like two years. You were saying you were working in in security cybersecurity before this like what's what's kind of your career path well uh i was involved in a company called zen edge early on and zen edge is an enterprise security firm yeah i've done a bunch of uh tech stuff all kinds of tech startups uh my partner you're in this business the co-founder of a business he he comes with you know maybe 15 20 years of uh, this type of experience and uh, he built a if you have an Android phone and try to take a picture and you see the little circles around the face, the yeah. facial recognition, so Yuri built that, oh, wow. uh, sold it to Google. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. He's, he's certainly much more accomplished than I am. But uh, Are there any particular skills or any, I don't know, any, any classes or schooling or experience that, that you have found valuable over the years to, to get you to where you are? Well, outside of the technical stuff, which obviously you need, yeah. everything else was trial and error. I mean, you know, I went to school, I graduated, but it's, uh, I didn't go to school necessarily to learn how to, you know, uh, how to act in the real world. It's, it's all trial, a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. And then I guess, I guess the final question then, cause this is always curious is this when you, especially when you have a few people that get together, like, how do you choose who's going to be CEO? <laughs> how did you figure out like you will be the CEO? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's just, I mean, uh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> <That's> good. <laughs> I, I don't feel like we ever had to, it's just, it was natural, I suppose. Really? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, good oh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm curious how a group of friends with the same skill set we, we would we would fight it out. I'm I'm very curious. <laughs> get get a I don't know get some pugil sticks or something, and <laughs> whoever wins. Yeah. yeah this, in this case, the skill set was very clear, and 
this is what I've done for, you know, seven years or so out of school. Yeah, okay. Good, good. So, uh, so are there fi- any final thoughts you'd have for the for the viewers that are watching this about uh, about the Cujo or about starting a startup company or IoT or any of those type of things? Oh yeah. So a couple of things, and if I can use this, uh, we're looking for more beta users, really for techie people who um, have interesting networks, are passionate about IoT. Okay. Uh, and if anyone wants to uh, ping me just with questions or or, or ask for a beta. Uh, uh, you know, I, I hope you can contact me at evg at getcujo.com. Okay. Evg at getcujo.com. Uh, with respect to startups, um, just well, what can I say? You know, it's it's living the dream, one crisis to the other. Yeah, yeah. Just just keep doing it, chin up, and uh, it's the best job in the world, yeah. uh, but it's also the, the most demanding job in the world. Okay. Cool. Good. Well, thank you for talking with us. And uh, so any of the, the viewers at home want to take a look at this, it's getcujo.com, right? Exactly. And uh, exactly. it's C-U-J-O, just like the dog. Um, and uh, so it's a neat little IoT security device. And so uh, thank you for talking with us today. And uh, I'll definitely uh, tell everybody to go take a look at this thing. Thank you very much.